Imagine yourself on an airplane in the midst of turbulence. The pilot comes on warning you there's going to be an emergency landing, then you start going down. What are you and your fellow passengers going to do next? Hi, my name is Cam and this is Cognitive Dissonance, a series about the assumptions we make about ourselves and others and the many ways we get it wrong. Today, we're looking at the dark side of man. More specifically, how we treat others when we face an emergency that is literally life or death. Whatsoever therefore is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, there is no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes' bleak writing on human nature laid the foundation for what Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal would later coin as veneer theory, a summation of human morality as merely a cultural overlay hiding an otherwise selfish and brutish nature. And even though de Waal coined his theory as a means to criticize Hobbes' writing, the underlying philosophy of veneer theory has become ingrained in our cultural assumptions about human behavior. Between popular works like William Golding's Lord of the Flies, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, and TV's The Walking Dead, each of these depict a sudden break from civilized normalcy and a quick descent to every man for himself. In almost all cases where humans are faced with sudden, unexpected, large shocks, disaster, actually the first impulse that humans have is to look around and to ask themselves the question, hey, is everybody okay? And you wouldn't believe how hard you have to work with uh, people, not just students, but everybody, to convince them that this is really the case. This is Dr. Tom Postmus, a social psychologist of the University of Klom in the Netherlands. He specializes in group behavior during times of crisis and emergency. People have to imagine being on a plane and a pilot comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. We need to return to the airport now. You know, and everybody buckles up and gets into position and it's incredibly stressful. And in many other situations, the plane crashes to the ground and you know, it's horrible. There might be fire and smoke. The, the luggage might be falling out. And the question I ask my students and, and, and at lectures is, look, there are two scenarios, two planets. Planet A is the planet where everybody gets out as quickly as they can. They realize, you know, we got to escape this. It might blow up. We need to go now. And some people get left behind or they cannot get out or they might even get trampled over. And planet B is the planet where the first response is, as soon as the plane gets quiet, everybody knows we have to get out. But the first response is to look to your neighbors and to ask, are you okay? And everybody will get help. And if people die, they die because they don't get out quickly enough. Virtually everybody will say, look, we live on planet A. And the truth is that in all those planes that have crashed, that very, very rarely happens. And the overwhelming majority of situations is planet B. Early evidence for Dr. Postma's Planet B depiction of human nature began to surface in the aftermath of World War II, where civilian bombing raids were being carried out across Europe with the intent to demoralize and panic civilian populations, but instead had the opposite effect. They brought communities together and increased citizen engagement with the war effort. Then again in 2010, when a collapse at the San Jose mine in Chile left 33 miners trapped 700 meters underground, the men rationed three days worth of food to last the group two weeks and organized a one-man, one-vote democracy to look for ways to escape and maintain group morale. But while a bombing raid or a plane crash presents a visible and immediate threat, what happens when the emergency in question is slow-moving and invisible? What we're seeing with COVID is that in many countries, people respond immediately to this threat. In the Netherlands, it was actually before the government imposed measures, people started voluntarily to change their behavior. All the things we consider normal just change within a matter of days for the whole population. It really speaks to this very strong impulse to help, to be responsible, to do the right thing. To give you an example, when the COVID outbreak had just happened and everybody realized, okay, we need to distance, we need to distance. You could see on the street that people were very actively looking at each other, trying to make sense of these new behavioral rules. Without using words often, they were seemingly negotiating. How are we going to maneuver around 
each other in this space, in the city, in the office, wherever it happened. As more of these behavioral routines become entrenched, we, we don't need to do this, right? It becomes automatic and we get expectations of how I am to behave and how others are to behave. I'm not gonna lie, the events of 2020 have not exactly given me widespread optimism for mankind or our future. As we live through a world historic pandemic, the largest civil rights movement in two generations, and an ever increasing climate emergency, it's easy to mistake cynicism for realism. But the fact is, the most negative assumptions about ourselves are rarely the most accurate. The odd thing is that if you ask this plain A, plain B question to young children, then they display the kind of reactions that we might call as adults naive. So they assume that others are gonna be good to you. Well, in that situation, of course, they are right. If you like this video and would like to see more videos like this, then make sure to click subscribe below. Also, if you have a topic you'd like to see us cover on cognitive dissonance, then leave that in the comments as well. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one.